Hello, I'm Gareth O. Davis, and welcome to another Fighting Spirits podcast. In this episode, I catch up with Andre Ward. It was recorded in the summer of 2018, but I talked to him about his life and his stellar career in which he left the sport undefeated and widely regarded as the number one pound-for-pound boxer in the sport. A fascinating hour with Andre Ward. Enjoy. Well, it's pretty fitting that we've got Frank Sinatra in the background. So I'm, I'm, I'm here in, uh, well, it's Castro Valley. We're near Haywood. I'm here with the one and only Andre Son of God Ward, um, one of the great, great modern boxers. We're, we're having a bit of breakfast um, in one of your favourite uh, breakfast haunts. Denica's, is it? Denica's, yeah. yeah. It's uh, September the 21st you, you retired. You announced your retirement from boxing. I think you weren't even 33 at the time. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was 33, yeah. Yeah, um, you had gone undefeated throughout your entire professional career, two-weight world champion, and I think really <clears throat> ended your career as the number one pound-for-pound pound boxer in the world. And, you know, two terrific fights to end very high profile against Sergei Kovalev. You made yourself the unified heavyweight, light heavyweight champion of the world, having dominated at super middle for so long. Um, you know, we're, here we are, three, just four months later. Um, you don't look any different. You look very happy. Slightly longer beard on you. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were just talking before I started recording about we, we mentioned the word retirement, Andre, but really you haven't retired. It's, it's the beginning of the rest of your life. I mean, that, that's the reality of it is uh, some days it does feel like a retirement, you know, and, and what I mean is, is, you know, the reality or the magnitude of the decision I made, you know, it'll hit you all at once, you know, and you, and you get a revelation that, you know, I may never, ever do this again. And that, that's a lot when you've done something for, you know, uh, two decades, but... Then, you know, reality sets in and you realize that, you know, you've been blessed with, with other gifts, other talents. And, and then I look at the fact that, you know, me and my wife, we we lived with this day in view. You know, we went about my career with this day in view. And, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm like, I'm relieved that we did that because um, instead of being at a standstill, searching for purpose and trying to figure out what's next, you know, we just kind of segue from one thing to the next. Did that just... You know, kind of merit a lot of planning in that sense. That, I mean, uh, and many of us have met your wife. You know, those of us who've covered your career um, closer. I mean, I think I remember meeting your wife for the first time. I didn't meet your wife, but she was with you when you did the round of media stuff ahead of pre- pretty much the kind of the semis and the final of the uh, Super Sixes. That would have been back in maybe eight years ago now. Um, yeah, to, to 2011. And, and so you were planning an exit strategy from the sport. Does that mean you were setting up businesses and, I don't know, kind of having a rental portfolio or whatever it is? When I say plan, I mean, of course, you know, the, I didn't have an exact year or, or date in mind, but I had to come to grips with the fact that the date was gonna, gonna be here. Mm. Um, and you don't know how you're gonna accept it until it actually comes. It's like a fight, you know, you can plan, you can watch film, you can, we'd have a great training camp, but you won't know how you're gonna react under those lights with the type of pressure that you're gonna be under against that particular opponent until you actually get in there. Um, So it's the same with retirement. Um, And of course, from a financial standpoint, you wanna enjoy life and enjoy the fruits of your labor. But again, you have to know that that the end is gonna come and then you have to realize or, or ask yourself, like, tangibly, what am I going to have when that day comes? And um, that will help structure, you know, your spending and what you spend and what you don't spend. Um, and, and from a, you know, investment standpoint, you know, uh, me and my team, we've always been conservative. You know, we take risk where need be. Um, but I've seen too many horror stories. I've seen too many horror stories of not just fighters, but athletes who sacrifice, who, you know, put their bodies at risk and, and just do all that athletes do. And 
you look up and have nothing to show for it, man. That, that's probably one of the saddest stories in 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 the world to to hear is someone who dedicated two plus decades and then you look up and say okay what do you have to show for that uh nothing i'm you know i'm on government assistance and you know i don't have much and i'm living with you know a family member like that just breaks my heart and i saw a lot of that when i went to canastota new york maybe three years ago three going on four years ago and uh there were a handful of fighters there like oscar tito uh, joe calzaghi who uh made those same sacrifices but they looked fresh, they looked good, and you could tell they had their business handled. But there were too many who uh, did not, and um, it just broke my heart. It just broke my heart, and I didn't want to be named in that in that category. So how has, has four months passed for you? Um, has it been difficult to, have there been days when you thought, man, you know, you, you, there must be holes, because you, you, you had an opponent named, it might have only been two a year, but you're in camp, you know you're living right. You're looking. You're looking after your body. Have there been moments in the last four months when I'm not saying you're regretting it, but maybe you're missing it, or maybe you're thinking, "Am I complete? Have I completed? Was there more to do? I never fought Adonis Stevenson. Could I have fought a heavyweight? Blah blah blah." I don't think regret is the word. Like you said, I think uh, I think you miss it. <laughs> you miss it, and. You know, I was talking to a fighter, I won't, I won't name him, but I was talking to a fighter a couple weeks ago who, you know, kind of at the same stage that I was, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't know, six, eight months ago where, you know, he's kind of winding down and, you know, he said, man, when I'm done, I, you know, that's it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to miss it. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I said, listen, man, you're going to miss it. Like, there's, it's just, it's, it's ingrained in who you are. You're going to miss it. And my passion, Napoleon Kaufman, um, played six years in the NFL, so all about all American in college, and uh, just abruptly retired from the Oakland Raiders, um, similar to myself, mm -hmm. uh, to go into ministry. Mm -hmm. And he pretty much hit it on the head. He said it's a, it's a detox process. I talked about this on Jim Lampley's show. Mm -hmm. um, I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "It's," he said, "It's going to hit you in waves, meaning you're going to miss it, you know, dearly." In waves, you're going to um, you got some rough days, but then that'll start to subside over time, and 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 not fighting will become the norm. You know, not being in the ring, not going to the gym or yep. boxing gym specifically, will be the norm uh, versus it not being the norm. And I and that's what I've experienced. And I've had days where, you know, I've been to a Raider game, walked down the same back corridor, the same lot, the F lot, that I used to walk down to get to the entrance of the arena, Oracle Arena, where I fight when I'm when I'm at home. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I saw the same security that'll normally see me in. Walk through the same metal detector I've always walked through. <laughs> Those are moments when it hits you. It triggers though. It triggers oh. and, and it stayed with me. That was in the morning and that stayed with me all day and all night. Uh, I've shed some tears over it. Really? Um, and I know I made the right decision. Um, but I always, if you look back, you know, when I've talked about retirement, I've always said that my day is gonna come when I have to back up the talk, meaning me saying that I wanna leave on top and, 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 and leave with my faculties. And, you know, I said, I'm gonna have to like, like actually walk that out and prove that one day. And, and here's the day. So at some point we're gonna have to face this as fighters. Whether they're pushing us out the door or whether we're trying to walk out the door. We're gonna have to face this day. We're gonna have to miss it. We're gonna have to, you know, wrestle with ourselves. And and at the end of the day, you know, I'd rather face that hole in my right mind, fresh, young, than having to face this this same pain. You know, uh, you know, when you're in your 40s, and you know, you probably should have been done five years earlier. It's just it'd be a tougher process. It's very interesting because um, clearly um, you're one of the very few who's ever walked away, um, certainly in the modern era. I mean, people did retire slightly earlier or later even going back in time. But um, I just wonder, um, I mean, I, I put this to Virgil Hunter the other day, uh, your esteemed and long-standing trainer, um, whether you might come back one day. And he said, well, never say never, but you know, um, the right fee against the right opponent, the right challenge, 
it's very difficult for any man or any woman to 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 turn that down because you'll always be competitive you'll always be a warrior um, and so there is if I can put that to you that there if the right person emerges in the next two or three years and it's like now nah, this guy would have beaten Andre Ward this guy's yeah. clearly and that's coming, this guy's a, that, that's coming by the way the boxing like boxing is not gonna just let me walk away like they, I'm gonna be tested at least once something's gonna happen um, I'd be shocked if no one called my name at some point. I'd be shocked if there wasn't some type of pushing or prodding to try to, to gauge my interest of some sort, even if it's not done publicly. But if it's not done publicly, what do you do? <laughs> I mean, whether it's, whether it's publicly or not publicly, um, you, got, you got decisions to make. And it's interesting because you know, I'm working on my documentary right now, and uh, it's gonna be good too. It's gonna be good. And uh, is it a film, Andre? Is it a documentary film? It's a it's a full length doc, and uh, it's a lot of never before seen footage, and it's a lot of you know just things that I'm that I'm I'm touching on that I've never touched on before, um, and I'm excited about it. Um, but in, in this process and gathering some of the interviews, you know, we interviewed Michael Jordan uh, and he said something profound and I won't give it, give it all away, but basically on the page of retirement, you know, he basically said, listen, every time I retired, you know, I meant it and I really felt like I was done. He said, but each time I came back, the desire was sparked and then I would test and see where I was at and I still had it. And, um, so in other words, he's saying trust your instincts, mm -hmm. trust your gut. And he's saying that whatever decision you make, it's your decision to make. So if I were to come back, there would be the people who say, oh, I knew he was coming back. Oh, no, nobody retires early, blah, blah, blah. You know, then you'd have some people on the other side that would be happy. Like, man, we can get another one or two out of it. <laughs> so you're going to have people on both spectrums, but whether people like it, whether people dislike it, whether people applaud it or criticize it, it's my decision to make. And I do know that the decision was a sincere decision. It was something that I felt um, it was time to do from a physical standpoint. People have no clue, and this is these are things that we'll we'll we'll, we'll give you know just the fans and, and just you know people who are watching just a inside glimpse of the things I've gone through yeah. over the last I don't know how many years. Um, everything that I went through leading up to Kovalev 1, it's going to be shocking. Like, people's mouths are going to fall to the floor when they see what I had to go through in the first camp and hours before I went to the arena. So when you're dealing with that kind of stuff, that helps you make your decision um, on retirement. It's, it's not just... You wake up one day and say, I don't want to do it anymore. It's, it's, it's an accumulative effect. It, it's a multitude of decisions that help you make to make the decision. They're cleaning around us here. I've got a lady behind me cleaning the... They look after this Danica's restaurant very well. She's cleaning these beautiful pictures of very beautiful children, actually, who must be members of the family and so on. Um, Andre, you mentioned the documentary. It sounds fascinating. Um, when are we going to see it, do you think? Is it, will it, when will it come? Yeah. It will come out this yeah. year. Yeah, we should be done with... Um, we should be done with uh, all the production stuff mm -hmm. you know, at the end of January, mm -hmm. which is you know a week or so away, and then we'll be in post-production. And you know that's a long process, but yeah. like. I'm but you're actively involved in it. Are you with the yeah, editing yeah, and everything? Executive and, yeah. Oh, executive producer line, Andre. Are you Andre S O G Ward in the credits? I, know, I haven't gotten that far <laughs> yet. I, I honestly haven't, but I like the way that sounds. And but it's work. But it, it's been like a, a passion. Oh, so that's what you've really been working hard on. That's, isn't one, it? that's one of many. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of many. Mm -hmm. I'm also working on um, uh, a boxing fitness chain uh, with George Foreman III called Everybody Fights. Oh, wow. uh, it was established in, in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, they have two locations there. They have a location in, in New York, uh, soon to be opening up another one. Um, they just broke ground in the Midwest, and now they're coming out west uh, to the Bay Area. So. Um, that, along with, you know, just staying in the community, um, I still, you know, do meet and greets and, 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 and spend time with my fans, you know, I have a clothing line, um, and just my business affairs, man, it's, it's full time, trust me, like, 
I've yet to get the lazy boy chair. <laughs> retirement is not slow motion. It, it's a well, lot. it's not retirement. That's the point. That, it's the start the of the rest. We, that, that's what we said at the outset. It's not retirement. So it's, uh, it, it's, it, a, it's a proper job. It's a refocusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it's been good. I've actually been more busy now than I have when I was active. Mm. Because mm. boxing took You had the excuse of boxing then. Boxing took up most of my time. So if I didn't call a person back, I had an excuse. I was in the gym. You know, if I, if I, was, if I was slow to return an email, you know, people understood. But now that stuff is to the forefront and it's funny because i'm i'm almost having to relearn some things you know i'm having to, to be on a normal person's schedule like normally with my friends and family i've gotten the pass over the years because they they say hey let's go on a vacation or let's let's go eat dinner you know two months from now three months from now i'm like listen i barely know what i'm doing next week like i can't plan anything six months out i don't have that excuse anymore so i've had to pull out the calendar and, and, and figure it out and just do what normal people have always done so it's a bit of an adjustment so when you mentioned the um when you mentioned the the, the documentary it's fascinating because you know it's not something that's really out there but have, did did you have a crew with you for your last few fights as well you know kind of filming you behind the scenes i mean is it the last two fights with kovalev or is it even before that andre that you were planning for it no it's before mm. Mm. i think um I think it's going to be fascinating. I think it's going to be fascinating. I think... I think... For, from, I think the goal for me um, with this documentary is... Like, at the very least, my harshest critic will walk away and say, You know what? I may not agree with everything, but I understand him. A little bit better I understand why he said some of the things he said or did some of the things he did and for you know my, my closest supporter to walk away and say wow I, I get him even more now like I, I, I really get it now um, and I think I'm good brother thank you thank you and I think honestly like not being in every tabloid and not talking to every reporter this is the time when it benefits you because there's so much that hasn't been said there's so much there's so many stories that haven't been told genuinely um and i'm just feeling compelled to tell them now well, well it's a very interesting theme that about you because um um there is no doubt that in some ways your career not your career but your but your profile i don't want to say suffered because it didn't in the end but there were certainly periods in your career where you refused to to play the fool, to play the I'm going to do the trash talk stuff. You were always incredibly authentic. You, you know, you've always been authentic. You've never been anything other than what you are. And I think, you know, there were times where you probably had the opportunity to really shout out there and, and build a following that wasn't really a following. It was a following that followed you to see if you're going to fail almost. Do you know what I mean? You know, because the bad guys always get popular in America, don't they? And you never played the bad guy. You played the bad guy in the ring. You know, and that's the only time you did it. And you, you, no, but you were unshakable. You had an unshakable self-belief, an incredible technique, um, an impenetrable psych, psyche, I think, um, and skills. I mean, skills, skills to die for. Um, we know that now. We, I mean, um, and I've also learned, I didn't realize this at the time, that when you went to Athens in 2004, you were very much an underweight light heavyweight as well a lot of people you know. don't talk about that no well I'm, i i spoke to virgil hunter about this the other day and i'd like to ask you about that as well and, but 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 on that subject of never compromising um it it's a difficult thing in life and people who manage to do it tend to be very successful to be authentically yourself and in boxing we see people be copies of other people and try and do things and you know you mentioned Conor McGregor just now and he's done his own thing and he had that fight with Mayweather he's made a hundred million US dollars doesn't need to, to fight again um, you mentioned it before we started recording um, but I suppose being authentic to yourself is what serves you ultimately in the end so you weren't prepared to really trash talk you got into it with people yeah, I, was, I was firm yeah I, w I wasn't gonna take any mess mm. for sure but I just didn't do it like, um, I didn't fit the stereotype. I didn't fit the stereotype. And uh, I'm unapologetic about that. Um, because, you know, 
just like we're talking about retirements and different things like that, like, like I'm a true student of the game. Like, you know, when I first fell in love with the sport, um, like I, I, I fell in love with the sport and I watched it and, and I studied guys, you know, even before, you know, social media blew up the way that it did. Um, I think I started boxing. On tape. Yeah, on tape. <laughs> I've had VHS tapes stacked to the ceiling. Um, the good old days. The good old days. <laughs> Simplicity. Yeah. And I just asked a lot of questions. And I would study guys like Roy. I would study guys like Bernard. I would study guys Hopkins like... Hopkins and Jones there, by the way, for those listening. Yes, Bernard Hopkins, Roy Jones. Um Floyd Mayweather early in his career when he was pretty boy Floyd. And, and very aggressive as well, wasn't he? Yeah, 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 people yeah. forget that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson, you know, just all of those things. Um, so that was that piece of it, the education piece and seeing some of the discrepancies about how guys were treated, seeing how um, a standard was lifted over this guy's head but not this guy's head, but what's the difference and really just trying to understand it. And then Verge was, Verge was very... Virgil Hunter, you know, my coach was very well read, um, and he would educate me a lot. My father would educate me a lot um, on the behind the scenes, because obviously, you know, that was their era in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I was always a, a young guy who was ahead of his time, and I, and I just loved being around. Like, I'm more comfortable in a room full of older men than I am my own peers, because I feel like I can relate more. Mm -hmm. Cool so, learning, though, as well, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just, I don't know, I just, I, I felt like I had a good a good understanding of the game. And then getting in the game, watching certain things and still studying even as I, even as I was active. Um, that persona, so to speak, that burden to be that guy is not placed on everybody's shoulders. Mm -hmm. You don't see them placing that shoulder on Golovkin. And I'm just talking American media because I think the UK media, I think they do a tremendous job. I think they're very objective. If you look at if you if you look at the reporting before and after fights compared to American reporting, you'll see a vast difference depending on who the American media likes and doesn't like. You'll see it's a vast difference. If I put if I put Kovalev one on a bulletin board and let you see everything that was written beforehand and after U.S. side, U.K. side, you, you'd be shocked. It's a, it's, it's a tale of two different stories. Mm -hmm. So that's been going on from the beginning. Um, because when something is different, I'm not saying I'm, you know, the rarest guy, you know, in the bunch, but there was something a little different about me. There was something a little different about my team's approach. You know, I spoke openly about my relationship with God. My, my intent was not to be annoying or, 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 you know, pushy about it. But if guys can talk about how many women they sleep with, if guys can talk about, you know, the, the, the alcohol and the drugs, and I mean, if, the flashy cars, the, the jets, all that. If that's okay, yeah. why is it not okay to, to give you my honest answer about how I feel I got here? So it was that. Um, people ask, is race involved? Um, I can't judge any individual news outlet or any individual reporters intense I'm not that good that's not I can't do that and that's a heavy coat to put on someone mm. but there there has been discrepancies between African American fighters and fighters that are not African American and I've spoken about this just because Floyd Mayweather did it a certain way doesn't mean that everybody has to do it that way or else they're not exciting or they're not worth listening to or watching and it's really offensive, not just for me, but also for my peers to see that because when those guys crash and burn trying to be the next Floyd Mayweather, nobody's there to save them. Those same guys that are pushing them to be that way are the same guys that are going to be the first to try to break a story if something happens. Guy gets arrested. Guy gets in trouble. Guy, you know, fails a drug test. So to say all that is to say when I see this and then I start to develop a relationship with God, where he's changing my life in real time, you know, just when I'm turning pro right before the Olympics and like all of this is going on, it's not just me being true to myself. I ultimately learned to take my eyes off of myself and be true to him. I had a revelation of who my gift came from 
the reason I was in the position I was in. And that was a heavy burden to wear. And I knew that, I didn't know initially, but I soon found out that when I proclaim the name of Jesus, when I speak openly about my faith in God and specifically Jesus Christ, that that's gonna come with some backlash. That's gonna come with some ridicule. That's gonna come with um, some shame. That's gonna come with a stench from the world's perspective. When I fight for my business and say, man, I want this done a certain way. And, you know, this is how I want it done. And man, I've seen how things happen, you know, in past times. And I don't want my business to be handled like that. There's a there's an overreaction to that, you know. Then they bet against you. Well, this guy's gonna destroy me. That doesn't work. I, we beat the guys that they say are gonna beat us, and then then, then the resentment and the, and the and the frustration and the anger that it, it mounts, and then you just see this thing that's happening. But but ultimately, I feel like God used it to to help me, and it worked in my favor if I responded the right way to it. So in other words, that two years that I was off. That wasn't just about a lawsuit. That was personally for me. That was some growing up time. This, this is what Andre's talking about now. Is of course yeah. the dispute with Dan Goosen, the late Dan Goosen. Now, of course, and I'm sure you, you wish him well in the next life. But, but, but there was a big dis managerial dispute at the time, which we see all the time in boxing, that caused you to sit out for so long. And, and everyone talks about that period. You were out of the game. What a shame. But you did it your way again. Yeah, but it, it worked out. Didn't but it, it wasn't a shame. It was it was exactly the way it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. It was exactly the way it was supposed to be. That was a time of growing up. That was a time of, of, of uh, yeah, just 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 growing up and and maturing in my faith. Um, uh, it humbles you because now I'm I'm not in the spotlight. I gotta root the guys on and support the guys that are in my gym other young fighters that are coming up can I still fly and go to their fights and support them and sit front row when I know I'm going to be asked a slew of questions about my situation and when are you getting back in the ring and, and, and not to have any answers um, I learned to look at those same individuals and personal frustration as well there must have been incredible of course of course, of course. all of that frustration. Yeah, and your athletic prime you have to sit out yeah. for two years come on it must have been so painful yeah. you must have cried you know frustration um, um, sometimes feeling hopeless about the situation and, and never feeling like it was going to break, but also feeling resolute about my stance. Yeah. Um, Nelson Mandela in prison all those years. Yeah. You know, look what he did, yeah. you know? It, it's, it's, it's easy to give in. That's the easy thing to do. But it forges humility in you because you understand that, um, at least I understood that, man, listen, this, like, this isn't in my hands. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if this is going to like lift and break, like, God's going to have to do this. But everything that I gained in that two-year span, I don't know if I would have been ready for that last stretch of my career from a business standpoint, professional standpoint, without that season. Like, you know, as a believer, I got to forgive people that offend me because I want forgiveness. I got to forgive people that misunderstand me. I got to forgive people that may have an art against me, you know. I got a chance to do that in that two-year span. Individuals that I knew didn't have the story, didn't take the time to inquire to me and talk to me, but will write nasty things, tweet nasty things, mm -hmm. try to you know tell people, I oh, don't follow him, he's blowing it. I got a chance to really mature and look mm -hmm. those people in the eye and say, man, listen, we may not go have lunch, but I forgive you, man, it's all good. That's what that period was about. That's what that time was about. And then I came out of that time stronger, smarter, a little bit more wiser, mm -hmm. humbler, but also understanding the pitfalls of boxing and what a what a jungle it is in many ways, you know, because you wouldn't have known till then. I came out season. Okay. I came out season. Yeah. And it's funny because even past that, you get a year past the lawsuit, you get, you know, uh, two years past the lawsuit, you get three years past the lawsuit, and those same critics, they'll still bring it up. This is after we signed the HBO deal. This is after the Rock Nation deal. This is after the Paul Smith fight. This is after uh, the Sullivan Barrera fight. They're still talking about it. This is after the Alexander Brand fight. They're still talking about it. This is, you know, with Kovalev 1 around the corner, the buildup for Kovalev 1. What about the lawsuit? Listen, the lawsuit is, is in the rearview mirror. I don't know why it's not in the rearview mirror for you guys. 
it's long in the rearview mirror for me. Yeah. Let's focus on this fight. And I had to start redirecting everybody's focus and attention to what was up ahead. But it just, it shows you something and it speaks to you and say, man, they're camping around this because we got out of it. And these are the same ones that said we weren't gonna get out of it and we were blowing it, but now there's some light and they're not acknowledging the light at the end of the tunnel. They wanna keep going back to what was behind. And it, it teaches you what you're up against. It's, it's a monster that me personally, I'm not going to change. And if I'm not careful, I'll let that same monster come and affect me to the point where I'll start to react with the same things that are coming at me. So in, in a nutshell, I grew and matured that season there would be no, no, no Barrera brand, Kovalev one and Kovalev two, the way it happened if it wasn't for that two year hiatus. Andre, um, there's a couple of themes I want to talk to you about. I've spoken to you about this before. When you were nine years old, you were a very decent baseball player growing up, you're very athletic. I'm sure you were decent at American football and all those things, track. I'm sure you ran 800 meters jumped over poles, did high jump, everything. Right. No, but, but, but once you discovered that dad, dad was a heavyweight, wasn't he, boxer, amateur boxer? No. Um, half Irish, half African-American. I'd love to meet him, by the way. Um, and once you discovered that he was a boxer. A little Scottish. A little Scottish in him. Um, uh, you, the kind of focus in, in, in Young boy's mind changed to, you know what? I want to be a boxer like my dad, no? Is that how it happened? You were nine years old? That's exactly how it happened. Probably about, um, I don't know, maybe 10 miles from here, 15 miles from here. Mm-hmm. Uh, sitting in front of our house. And I kind of knew my dad boxed, but like, he started to, to delve into the details, you know, about opponents, uh, his training, and my uncle, Bob Mason, they went to high school together uh, and Bob trained him, you know, and, and my dad trained Bob. And he just started like opening up about the details of everything and like going in depth about it. And I looked up to my dad, my dad was everything to me. So when I found out that he did it to the extent that he did it, it's a no brainer. Mm-hmm. I was like, dad, I wanna do it. I, wanna, I don't wanna play baseball anymore. <laughs> and the only caveat that he had was, listen son, if we do it, we're gonna do it right. We're not gonna half do it. I said, Ted, you got my word. And I left baseball that day and never looked back. Where, where, were, where were you in Oakland at the time? Where were you growing up? Because obviously he took you to meet Virgil Hunter and famously, <coughs> all the way to September the 21st, 2017, you were with Virgil. Even through the Olympics, he gave you over to the Olympic team, the American Olympic team, the amateur team, to go through the Olympics. At that time, we actually started at a gym in Hayward called U.S. Karate and Boxing. <clears throat> and that's where we met Virgil. Um, and when I first walked in the gym, actually the first day we went, the gym was closed. My dad kind of lifted me up on this, uh, this uh, to see the gym through this glass that was, you know, had been shattered. And <laughs> it was like love at first sight. The glass had been shattered. It shattered yeah. So it was a it tough was area. Well, yeah, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty tough area. I fell in love. I never seen like uh, an official boxing ring before. I never seen a <clears throat> heavy bag, heavy bags hanging in in a, in a row. I've never seen that type of atmosphere. <clears throat> so it just kind of, not kind of, it made me really want to do what I told my dad I wanted to do a few days prior. Disappointed it was uh, closed that day. Came back and uh, my dad signed me up, and I still have, I still have his sign up sheet, <laughs> his signature, the date, uh, everything. Uh, he got my birthday wrong on there though. <laughs> I think he was a month off. He put my birthday's uh, February 23rd. He put March 23rd. Um, but yeah, I have I have all of that frame. And we went back and we tra- trained with the house trainer, a guy named Seraphine. I was a good trainer, but his philosophy was to take two to give one. <laughs> and my dad, you know, my dad was a boxer. Yeah. You know, my dad idolized Muhammad Ali. He danced and moved, and he wasn't about that. Uh, a couple weeks passed, and you know I was hitting the bag. Virgil was there. I guess Virgil had been training, you know, training some fighters. Then he was also training himself. And they just started talking, man. I can remember hitting the bag and kind of looking over at Virg. And Virgil seeing. was still doing Smokies then, wasn't he? Or maybe he wasn't. For himself? Yeah. Oh, he'd given up by then. Yeah. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't competitive, but he was still training though. Yeah. And Virgil could fight. 
Oh no, I can see that. You know that about him. You can see it, yeah, he can fight. (laughs) So I I hit the bag and I look over at him, you know, I'm looking at this guy that my dad's talking to and then he kind of give me a a nod of approval and I hit the bag and then we ended up talking after and then my dad set up kind of like a mock session at our house. We had like this like this wood deck in the back that was almost shaped like a ring. And Verge came in with his mitts, man, and he just had a way about him. He just had a, he made it fun. Mm -hmm. And Verge left, my dad said, okay, we'll call you. And we talked, he said, what do you think? I said, man, it's great, I love it. Like, I really like him, like I wanna train with him. And that started the relationship. Incredible, really. And and just from, just go tell me what your, you had a break with him, of course. Not a break with him, but you, you went off to the Athens Olympics. It's 2004, um, what are you, 20? 20 years old. And you're fighting for the same medal that Muhammad Ali won in 1960 in Rome. Were you aware of that at the time? I was. And it's, it's just, it's still surreal to this day. <laughs> the magnitude of the event is so big, like you can't, you can't grasp it all. You just can't, you know, even, even leading up to it, you know, you, uh, you hear about it, you know, USA Boxing, they'll give you kind of a crash course on what to expect. <clears throat> It does you no justice. I don't say no justice, but it doesn't. It doesn't do it do the event any justice because you can't. You can't. You can't prepare for something like that. Um, even to this day, like it still blows my mind that the all-time greats in this sport. And I'm talking just amateur. Mm. My name is in the history books with them. No matter what I did as a professional, it was always going to be there. Unbelievable. It's my greatest achieve, achievement as a, as a fighter. Um, but the the games became real when I drew a first round bye I thought I was going to have to fight every night I drew a first round bye I had um, Italy in the second round um, and I went to the opening ceremony one of the greatest experiences of my life mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the chills that I had um, the emotions that I had Unreal, unreal, unreal. That's when it became real to me that this was something that was bigger than myself. Do you think America, you know, famously Muhammad Ali, whether he did or not, we don't know now, but famously he threw his gold medal back because he wasn't, yeah, when he came back because, you know, because of the race divide at the time and he wasn't allowed to go in the bar he wants to, or the restaurant he wants to go into. Do you feel, did you feel when you came back with your gold that you were, you were recognized uh, fully? Did you go and meet the president? Did you do all those kind of things? Were, were, there, were there special things for you when you came back? And of the tournament itself, did you just fly through it at the age of 20 with, with nerves? But, but when you're 20, you just get on with it? Or was it kind of nerves every round and, um, you know, like, wow, I'm, 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 it's growing on me here that I could achieve what Muhammad Ali achieved. No, it was, it was very much, very much on my mind. It was very much something I felt. Um, you know, you got to realize I was 20 years old and I hadn't lost. Since lost. you were 13. <laughs> yeah, 13, 14 years old. It'd been, it'd been a long time. And the standard that we had in the house, the standard that we had in our camp, like we expected to win. Even though nobody else expected us to, we expected to win. So it was a personal pressure and there was a personal uh, uh, expectation, man, that was there. So I, I felt that. I felt, I felt obviously being there and being amongst the athletes and, and, and being in the Olympic Village and being in, in Greece after we had just went to war in 2004, the tensions were very high. We were not liked by, by pretty much anybody. Mm-hmm. All of that was kind of circulating in the air. We had a, um, a private, not a private investigator, but like a, a what do you call it? Like a um, private security. We had private security. You know, we had one guy who would kind of case the field. You know, like we were in the American College of Greece two weeks before we went to um, to the village. Oh, in your training camp. <clears throat> yeah, training camp to prepare. And uh, you know, we we'd run at a local park or or, or you know walk from the um, our. our kind of our apartments to the American College of Greece to work out and eat and, and you know, get physical therapy. And this guy would have to always go ahead of us and, and check and make sure everything was okay. So that all of that was weighing on me. Like, this is serious. You know, I told my family not to come. 
Um, that was bittersweet. Some of them didn't listen and they came, and I'm happy they did. Because I had, you know, out of all those people in that arena, I had a handful of people that were there with signs supporting me, um, encouraging me, and, and, and that went a long way. Um, yeah, but the magnitude of the event was, was real, and it was before me. And I took it very serious, and I felt the pressure. The pressure was tangible. You know, you can cut it with a knife. But um, I was blessed because, uh, again, my faith brought me through because we talked about this since I've been a kid. I had a little, what we call a burner phone, kind of a throwaway phone. And I was able to communicate with Verge. Oh, really? Okay. I was able to communicate with him. And he was actually in Greece, couldn't see each other. He and a, uh, a few people had rented an apartment and did some different things, so they were, they were on the ground. And he just continued to remind me, listen, son, we talked about this. Listen, man, you're undersized, but you're here for a reason. Listen, man, God don't have you here just because. Like, those were the type of things that helped me deal with the pressure. It helped me deal with the magnitude of the event. And, and then also being undersized and, and um, just all of that stuff. And then we get the draw, and I've got the toughest draw. And I can remember... Julie, who's you know been my publicist for many many years, she called Verge in a panic. Trey's got the toughest draw. And Julie Goldsticker, this is. You don't use you don't use family names when you speak, do you? I'm just reminding it's Julie Goldsticker. She deserves credit. She's a great yeah, no, lady. I do, but I'm just you know yeah, yeah. I, I just don't think to to, <laughs> to say the last name. Um, that's my fault. Um, she called him kind of in a panic, like Trey's got the toughest draw. And this isn't right and this isn't fair. And Verge said, he said, listen, listen, calm down. He said, this is the way it's supposed to be. And I can remember thinking like, really? <laughs> this is the way, like, what are you talking about? But that's how he was. Yeah, yeah. And sure enough, man, I had Clemente Russo, first night, um, quarterfinals, Evgeny Makarenko, two-time world champion. That was my moment. Mm -hmm. Evgeny Makarenko, that was the moment where I went from being an unknown with no respect, who was this small kid who should be in a lower weight class. He's fighting at 178 pounds. Mm -hmm. Should be fighting at 165 pounds. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have any major international experience. When I beat Yevgeny Makarenko, now I was on everybody's radar. Now they took me serious. And when you came home, Andre, did, did, in, in keeping him in that theme, do you think you got the credit you deserve? Does America give the credit it deserves to people who've achieved what you achieved? And of course, you'd won the same medal. The new the headlines must have been that, that you'd won the same medal that Muhammad Ali had won, you know, uh, 44 years earlier. I'll say it like this. I think, um, I'm a firm believer that what's for me is for me. I'm a firm believer that, you know, Whatever plan God has for me, the big picture and everything in between, like as long as I do my part, like it's gonna come to pass and that's what it's supposed to be. So when I was younger, I had moments where I, I compare, you know, maybe the love or lack of, you know, uh, respect that I got when I got home versus some other guys. But then I quickly matured and realized, listen, what came to me was mine. You know, the guys in the 2000 Olympics, you know, Rocky Juarez, Ricardo Williams Jr., those guys got maybe four times the signing bonus I got. But I looked at it like, this is what I was supposed to have. I didn't get the million dollar signing bonus, but maybe I wasn't ready for the million dollar signing bonus. The attention and the notoriety I got, you know what? That's probably all I could handle at the time. And I just shifted my, my thinking and my focus where it's not always a, you know, woe is me, I'm not getting what I deserve. Well, I, got what, I got what I was supposed to get. Even as I look at my career as a whole, you know, people say, oh, they, no, listen, man, things could have been bigger, things could have been worse. I got everything I was supposed to get at the time I was supposed to get it, and that was that. And there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, there's a contentment there where I'm thankful. Like, I'm thankful for everything I've gotten, everything I've experienced, every dollar I've made. 
my legacy is set. Now, I'll let the, the, the pundits and I'll let the critics debate on, you know, how great, I know what I've accomplished. I don't talk about it a lot. Like, I, I know what I've accomplished. You know, you look at like even fighter of the year for 17. I think outside of what Terrence Crawford did, um, unifying all the belts, um, and maybe the fight that, that Anthony Joshua had, I think that was more of a, a fight of the year candidate than it was, you know, fighter of the year candidate. But I think I probably had, next to Terrence, probably the most significant victory of the year. And it works against you because it was in the middle of the year, and it works against you because, you know, it was one fight. But the significance of it, especially coming off the first fight, I don't, I don't know if, if there's any other fight that had that kind of significance and that kind of win. But I don't worry about it. I don't, I don't, I don't get on social media and talk about it. I don't call guys out because it's not, it, listen, it must not have been for me in 2017. So let me tip my cap to the guy that got it and move on about my life. Andre, um, I, we're in your very busy, one of your very busy favorite restaurants. It's got busier and busier as we've been here. We can hear children screaming, all the tables are filling up. That's why there's a lot more hustle and bustle behind us. There's a few things I, I want to go over. You, you've won Olympic gold, you're into your career. Um, you really came on the radio for all the sports media when this classic Super Sixes started. You know, you were already um, being talked about. Is this the guy that's the number one in the super middleweight division? We, you knew. <laughs> Perhaps I, I, I thought I knew. I, I had to prove it though. Yeah. Well, well, that's what was so brilliant about that tournament. And obviously, obviously, this was the first time that really brought you into contact with with international media as well and, and you have become very popular in, yeah and you have become very popular in the UK and very popular in Europe I mean I would maybe even argue that you're in some ways in the long term your achievements I'm sure will be recognized fully and properly in the United States and they will and often when someone's gone people miss them more you know that, that happened with Lennox Lewis I believe you know um, but um, there were certainly three European opponents against whom you had chances to prove things, Arthur Abraham, um, Carl Froch and, and Mikkel Kessler, notably for, for people like myself, of course, Carl Froch. But, you know, I do remember your fight with Mikkel Kessler. It was, I mean, I think that's the, precluding the two Kovalev fights at the end of your career, Sergei Kovalev fights. That I, that, I watched that fight with Mikkel Kessler and, and I think you showed just how hard you are in that fight. You know, you, you went, you went to, you went to the Oakland trenches in that fight. You know, you were like the you were like the Oakland American football team. You, you were going to do whatever it was not to lose at home. Do you know what I mean? And maybe that's unfair on you in boxing terms, but I thought, you know, you were happy to kind of go in with a head that night. You, it's the, it's the roughest I've ever seen you. If, if that's fair, is that the roughest I've ever seen you? I mean, it was definitely a, it was definitely a rough, rough, rough and tumble fight. But and he was brilliant at the time, Kessler. No, like anything about. You know, I, like I don't know. I've said this before. Like I don't know how to be dirty <laughs> intentionally. Like, but again, that's that's another thing where it's easier for people to marginalize a performance or a win instead of just saying, you know what, I was wrong. Good fight. You were the better man. Um, oh, no, it was a great fight, but it was just hard. It, no, was, it was. I'm I, I'm saying it in a complimentary no, way. No, no, you I, know. It was, but I mean that that's you know obviously something that they took away. And tried to, you know, stain the performance, and that's been like a theme. Same thing in the frost fight. Well, yeah, but listen, man, listen, listen, we won. And and this is what I this is what I don't understand. Like, no, I thought it was a no. I, I disagree. I think against Froch, you schooled him. You schooled him. No, you schooled him. And, and he doesn't like me saying. It. I'm friends with Carl. I'm sure you are these days. Carl's a great guy. What I love about Carl is that. He's so competitive, it's easy to wind up, but he's a brilliant guy. I've had been on stage with him after dinners, to interviewing him now, and you know, he's had his nose straight, and no, we're good friends, and we've had rows down the years as well, because he's that kind of guy that rises, but no, you're the only guy he ever stepped in with who he just couldn't get to because he couldn't outbox him. You had the algorithm, you had the matrix. Well, honestly, I outfought him too. Yeah, and you outfought him in the end, yeah. I think that's what really bothered him. I think that's why 
And let me say this. Frotch hasn't gotten over that. But it's okay. Because he reminds me of myself. Uh, Kawasaki's the same way. In terms of the competitiveness. That was Kawasaki's greatest attribute. He wasn't the fastest, didn't have, you know, great, great boxer, great, you know, his father did a great job building him up, but it's the, it's the intangible. It's what you can't see, but it takes one to know one. I can look and say, this guy's insanely competitive. Mm. Insanely competitive. I can just tell. And Frotch is the same way, so that's why even today he can't give just doing credit. Like, if you, if you look at the things I said about him, when he retired versus what he said about me, they don't they don't line up. But I, I don't take it personal because, I mean, unfortunately, I think that he doesn't realize the type of look that gives him. It's not a good look. And, and I think even UK fans let him know about it. Because, you know, we battle, we fought. Um, you feel the way you feel, but, you know, it's a certain thing called class. I may feel a certain way about you, but when I have a microphone in my face, I don't have to be that guy anymore. Let me let me give you credit where credit is due because in, in the long run, it's the right thing to do, but I'm gonna look a little bit better down the road if I if I give you respect. So I don't I, I get Carl. I got him before we fought. That's how I was able to beat him because I understood his mindset. Um, and I don't take it personal, man. I don't. Joe Calzaghe is a good friend of mine as well. I'm in the, his movie, Mr. Calzaghe is one of the talking heads. Um, is that out? It's out, oh yeah, it's a great movie. You must watch it. It was made by Western Edge Pictures. You must watch it. It was out two or three years ago. Is it Netflix? Is it? Yeah, it's on Netflix, yeah. You must watch it, Andre. You'll love it. Yeah, I mean, I'm one of the talking heads in it, but it, 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 was, it was a privilege to be in it. Mr. Calzaghe. Mr. Calzaghe, yeah. I covered his entire career. And, and, and I've got to ask you, because I've always wanted to ask you this. You and Joe in your prime. Tough fight. What, what happens? Tough fight. I mean, first of all, like I have a lot of respect for, for Kalzaghi. I had a lot of respect for him before I actually met him. Then when he got inducted, uh, I was there in the uh, International Boxing Hall of Fame. And I didn't know what to expect from Joe. I didn't know if he, you know, was the, the, the former fighter who still kind of had the chip on his shoulder. So gracious, man. Joe Kazagi and his father were so gracious. I'm sure you know Joe. Yeah, he was, he was he was he was a little bit more he was. I guess that's the proper word. And it was just refreshing because I know how competitive the guy is. And I'm still active. He's not. He had been retired five years at the time. And he didn't have to like still be that guy. You know, and I respect that about him. Um, from a fighting standpoint, it'd have been tough fight. I obviously believe that I would have won, just like he believes he would have won. But his style, um, the busyness, um, the left-handed left stance, but two guys with a desire to win like we had, it would have ended ugly. And I don't know for who, but that would have been a fight for the, for the ages. That would have been a fight for the ages. Just because of who, just the way we were, our makeup, our, our build up. It would have been tremendous build up between his father and Virgil. I mean, just the whole thing would have been, I think that's a fight that I really wish that the fight fans could have seen, but we just missed each other just by a few years. Yeah, it's such a shame. And Joe did the right thing by fighting Bernard Hopkins and Roy Jones at the end. I mean, they were way past. Well, no, Hopkins was a genuine victory, and I, and I had it uh, very close that night with Joe by a point. Um, how has he been able to stay like retire and stay away? And Joe, his body and stuff, but like yeah, I mean I think I think the thing is with Joe, his hands were so damaged, and also psychologically he could not bear the idea of losing a fight in the end. It just grew and like you, it grew and grew and grew to the point where I'm mean, not spoken to Joe about this. He couldn't bear the thought of losing this record after being undefeated for 20 years. He could not bear the thought of it, and he'd had disappointment because he'd wanted to go to the Olympics, but because he was from Wales, he didn't get picked. Someone was picked over him in, in, in the team. And, you know, and you know, he'd had enough of his father driving him as well, you know? Because without his father, he wouldn't have got there, Andre, you know? He would not have got there. Um, Virgil, the other day, very uh, politically, uh, I thought, and diplomatically, said that you and Joe, the first fight would have ended in a draw and you'd have had a second one and then he wasn't going to pick the winner of the second fight. Surely he's got to pick you to win. I've got, I, I'm going for my boy on a split points decision. 
I don't. I can't pick a winner in that fight. It's probably you, actually. It'll be tough. Because you'd have t you might have taken it to him a bit more. I don't. I don't know. We'll never know. But it, it's it's a shame when 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 they don't overlap, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Much respect to him. Though. Um. Look. I mean. I I want to talk about where you are now and where you're going, and but also the last two fights of your career. The Super Six is really made your name. I feel. I mean. I you came into our focus then. You were this very kind of upright, huge man. Well, I remember meeting you for the first time. I was thinking, this guy's a super middleweight. How big is this guy? You know, you know. And we always thought, of course, that you were boiling down because you, in our mind, you'd won at light heavyweight okay. in the Olympics. So you were always boiling and boiling yourself down. And we went, oh, is this guy going to blow up? Do you know what I mean? Um, and I just remember thinking, God, what's this guy? Six one, and and big, but big. I remember when we met you. But ahead of the Atlantic City events, when, where of course you beat Carl Froch, and that made your name. And then you grew and grew. You had this time out. The last two fights and being under Rock Nation, for example, that was a massive help to you. And the last two fights with with Sergei Kovalev, because you proved beyond any doubt. Certainly, the first fight, which was a very hard fight for you, the second fight, one knows with you, there isn't a key to unlocking you this is what I find odd about your style it's a bit like Floyd Mayweather this is what I have found over the years there's nothing like watching you guys live because I know from the amount of boxing I've watched over 25 years or covered that there's certain guys they almost don't have a style they just adapt to the other guy they can mirror anyone and it's about them unlocking the other guy because there's nothing to unlock with you because you're just in the office is that fair? Yeah, I think so <clears throat> I think so and that's uh, that's one of my greatest attributes. You know, I use the the phrase from Bruce Lee, just being formless, like you know, water. Like water, I, I become what I need to become. Mm. And that's from years of uh, not being babied <laughs> in the gym and only sparring guys that would make me look good. Or if I got into a rough situation in a sparring session, my coach not calling the session around early. Um, gone back to the corner many a times frustrated because I'm fighting a, an older guy, more seasoned guy, and he's doing things that I really didn't know how to deal with, hitting me on the hip, hitting me behind my head, um, you know, trying to wear me down and Virgil say, figure it out, fight through it. Um, and then obviously having a great teacher with my father and Virgil, uh, they're, they're old school. They major on the fundamentals. Um, that got me out of a lot of trouble. And, and, and that caused me to get my opponents in a lot of trouble, but then be consistent, to be consistent um, throughout a 13 year career, really a 23 year career. And I don't think people understand just the, the amount of drive that I had in my preparation. Like it's not normal, it's not normal. Like, like every session was like an event, every session rather, and you know, some sessions I'm tired and I can't perform the way I want to in my mind, you know, whether it's a swim session, whether it's a, a, a running session, a, a sprint session, a lifting session, a boxing session. But the amount of intensity and focus that I put toward every rep, uh, I don't think people understand that. We didn't, I didn't train haphazardly. You know, I took the, I took the plan that Verge had, I feel like to the next level um, in terms of just my drive. And constantly he had to pull me back. You know, like a jump rope session. You know, see a lot of guys casually jump rope and kind of get in there for two, three rounds. That turned into a 20-minute session all out because I don't want to come into this fight ill-prepared. I have to be in the best shape. If you beat me, it's not going to be because I wasn't prepared. I won't be able to hang my hat on, you know, man, I, you know, I took you like, it just wasn't in my DNA. And because I had never been given anything in the sport, I knew I, it was, every fight was a, a, a must win. You've retired, you're working with M Michael Jordan, you're making a document. you are working with Michael Jordan, aren't you? I'm not working with him, but he's a friend of mine. We do business together. Uh, I'm, I'm still under his brand as an ambassador, um, and, and, and he graced our documentary with an interview, man, so I'm grateful for that. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, what you're going to go on to do. You've got children, haven't you? You have three children? Four. Three sons and a boy, three boys and a girl? Three boys and a girl? Three, three boys and a girl, yeah. yeah. Now I'm imagining, I'm trying to remember, they're probably about 12, 13, 14 now, are they? No, 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 no. So I got 16, 15, and then my daughter's 8, and my baby boy's 5. Okay. Gosh, you started young, didn't you? Yeah. 
So, what about you? You saw your father box, and it changed your life when you were nine. What about your sons? Is it going to be different, or your daughter? I mean, is it going to be different for your children? Do you, you know, you're a wealthy man now. I, 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 I know. I don't know if you're a wealthy man. You're certainly happy. You're, you're, you're content. Okay. You're not. If you weren't a wealthy man, you probably would still be boxing. But um, you. Do you have a view about them going into the sport that you made your career from? I mean, my two older boys, they never, they never took to it, and I never pushed it, and I was happy with that. Um, I got some big shoes to fill. Um, what are they going to do then? What would you like for them? Are they going to be privately educated? Are they going to be doctors and neuroscientists? And we, don't, we don't know yet. You know, they're still, you know, they're still young. You know, even at 15 to 16 years old, uh, they're still trying to find themselves. You know. Um, but Andre, knowing how you are, how you carry yourself as a man, surely you, I, I, I've got this feeling with you, and you are, a very, you are a gentleman and a gentle man as well, and no, I've known you long enough to, to be able to say that, you know, um, you've got, you know, you've got great boundaries, you've got appropriateness and perspectives, and, and it's great to be with you always, as you know, I, I enjoy my time with you so much, um, but I imagine as a man with his sons, coming from what you come from, you, you want them to... You don't want them to be too soft. You don't want them to have a silver spoon too much. You want them to know. You want to know that your boys can look after each other. No, for sure, for sure. For themselves. Mean, yeah, for sure. No, it's always something in the forefront of my mind. Um, but boxing wasn't in the cards for them, and I'm happy about that. Um, because you gotta have, you know, you gotta have an extraordinary drive, and then you have to have an extreme work ethic to even like be in a position to be successful in this sport. So like my. My um, my 16-year-old Andre Jr., uh, extremely smart kid. He's got a 3.5 on his report card. He goes to a college preparatory high school. Um, um, you know, he, he's talking engineering. Like we don't know. You know, Malachi is extremely smart. You know, my my 15-year-old, and he uh, really really talented in football. A smart kid. He got a 3.2 or a 3.3. His last report card. Um, same academic pressure that his brother's under. Um, so those guys just never really took to it, man. And, and like I said, we're still you know, watching, trying to figure out what they're going to gravitate toward. But I'm excited to see. Like, I'm not going to push it. But my, my, my youngest son, he, if anybody will box, it'll be him. But I'm going to try to steer him away from it. He, he's the hench one, the physical one. I think I remember you telling me that when he was like two or three, he's already... He loves it. He loves you won't be able to stop him, baby. You will yeah, not so. be able to stop him. Yeah. And once he excites you and you've been away... You'll be holding those mitts, and you'll be watching the the, the old videos with it's crazy him. Because, well, I'm already holding the mitts. That's the crazy part. He's got four or five pair of mitts laying around the house. He's got gloves. Like he's got gloves laying around. Like kids have black like, balls and 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 you know toys. Yeah. And he's a physical kid. You know, he, he's a funny kid. He's athletic. Um, he just loves it. Like he he's watched my fights over. Like I get tired of watching him because of him. He'll go to our DVR, and I'll walk in the room, and he's watching this. Dad, look at this. Or he'll watch the build-up to Kovalev 1 and Kovalev 2. He'll go to YouTube and find my stuff. He's five. It's not really natural. So I watch him, and I just want, I wonder if he's going to be the one. Andre Ward proving that he does... Well, you just proved, Andre Ward, that genetics actually don't lie because you've just gone on record there. And down the line, I think I'm probably going to be covering your son boxing in some form or other because I, that sounds undeniable to me. Yeah, it's, I'm just keeping an eye on him. He's playing a little basketball right now, so I'm hoping something else catches for him. Because boxing It passes on. It passes on, and even you, even though you're not admitting it, are kind of saying it, that it's passing on. Something passes on in the genetics. I see it, I see it, and but I think about the sport itself, the, phys the physical side of it, but I also think about the business side of it. It's tough business, it's very tough business. And I don't know, I don't know if I want to subject my son to that, but, I'm not gonna fully deny him. If I if I watch him and he's he's got something extraordinary, we'll consider it, me and my wife.
That was another Fighting Spirits podcast with me, Gareth A. Davis. My thanks to Andre Ward. If you liked it, please subscribe to my website, garethadavis.com. We'll see you next time. We'll be right back.